Okay, this is Dr. Neil Cross, and in this session I'll be looking at some uh, molecular studies uh, used in cancer detection and cancer subtyping. And in this lecture I'll be taking you over the, the technology that is used uh, to basically to do some genetic analysis of tumours, and that will give us some insight into uh, what the tumour is and the tumour behaviour. So to summarise the technology that I'm going to go through, I'm going to start off with some chromosome analysis. So looking at a technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization, and this allows us to look for chromosome losses and gains that we often see within cancer cells. Uh, cancers, uh, by definition, are a genetic disease that are driven by some genetic defects, and chromosome losses and gains are part of uh, the spectrum of abnormalities that we see in cancer. And then we're going to look at how the uh, fluorescence in situ hybridization or chromosomal gain in a specific example, which will be breast cancer and HER2 positivity, which I will move on to, we're going to look at how that is done in a lab and compare it to immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry is detection of the protein. So we are interested in the chromosomal gain, and that is driving the overexpression of a specific protein. So we could look for this by looking for the genetic abnormality by fish or the protein abnormality by immunohistochemistry. And then I look at a new technology which integrates both aspects of immunohistochemistry with in situ hybridization called SISH. Then I'll move on to more molecular uh, genetic studies. So this is sort of more cytogenetic, and down here we'll be looking at more molecular genetic studies, uh, looking for min minimal residual disease in cancer. So this is trying to detect tumor cells in patients' blood when you've taken the bulk of the tumour material away, but you can still times detect tumour cells in blood, and we'll look at a couple of different ways of doing that. And then this last bit, looking for genetic aberrations using this technique called multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification. For this, you will need to understand the principles of polymerase chain reaction. Now, I've put a separate resource on Blackboard called the PCR Primer Tutorial, and if you do not understand polymerase chain reaction, I strongly recommend that you go through that particular tutorial. It talks about where primers bind, how it amplifies DNA, how we analyze DNA. Uh, so if you've never done PCR before, I recommend that you have a look at that tutorial. If you've done PCR before, I recommend you look at that tutorial as well. So firstly, I'll give you a brief introduction to chromosome aberrations in cancer. And chromosome aberrations are some of the largest genetic abnormalities, or the largest genetic abnormalities, and they're very easy to see uh, because we can just perform chromosome analysis or carrier typing of cancer cells. And what we often find is in the normal tissue, we get a chromosome aberration. This could be some, this represented here is something like a translocation, where one bit of one chromosome breaks off and attaches to another chromosome. And that can be oncogenic, as in driving cancer, um, and we can often see these things present in cancer cells. Now, often what happens is a single cell will acquire an abnormality like this. That will give it a growth advantage, and then we'll see the same abnormality in all of the tumour tissue. So, within tumours, we often see very heterogeneous genetic abnormalities. So, sometimes we don't see a single abnormality present across all tumour cells. Now, an example I'll give you later, chronic myeloid leukaemia, we do see that. We see something called the bcr abel uh, Philadelphia chromosome. So we see that in every single cell, and it's a very clear, simple illustration, or an example of what can go wrong. In lots of solid tumours, you get heterogeneity, and you get lots of different genetic abnormalities in different cells. So in some cases, these chromosome abnormalities are actually the causative thing that initiates the cancer. And as we will see shortly um, in chronic myeloid, myeloid leukemia, the translocation that we're going to look at there is causative. In other cancers, these abnormalities happen later once a cancer is established. And these abnormalities can sometimes help us define whether the patient is going to have a good or bad prognosis. So looking for chromosome abnormalities is sometimes about diagnosis, sometimes it's about assigning prognosis for the patient. So this slide 
uh, represents what we call a karyotype. A karyotype is where we look at all of the chromosomes within uh, a cell, an individual cell, and assign them all, so chromosome 1 up to chromosome 22, X, and if there is one, a Y chromosome. And this is from a tumour called uveal melanoma, just happens to be a tumour type that I work on, so I'll use that as an example. And this has actually a very simple karyotype for a cancer cell. It's got gain of chromosome 2, chromosome 5, 7, 8, 9. It's got an iso chromosome 10. It's got numerical changes and very few structural changes. Now, if this was a colon cancer, it would be far more complicated than this. There might be, you know, 80, 90 chromosomes and most of them will be broken. So this is a very, very simple, solid tumour karyotype. Now, this is an interesting tumour type because the chromosome abnormalities present determine whether the patient is going to live or die. And we can do that, do that analysis by simple karyotyping, whereas here what we have done, we've taken some growing tumour cells, grown them in the lab in cell culture, stopped the cells at metaphase with a chemical called colchicine, that prevents metaphase to anaphase transition, we then fix the cells and then apply them onto a glass slide and then we trypsinize um, the chromosomes very lightly with uh, we did the enzyme trypsin um, and then we stain the chromosomes with just a uh, gemta stain it's just a purple stain and that the trypsin eats away differentially all the different chromosomes and gives a different banding pattern so what we've got here is a what we call a G banded carrier type and that allows us to identify all of the chromosomes. So for karyotyping, you need cultured cells. You need to be able to get the chromosomes in a suitable state so you can G-band them. And that's not always possible. And also, some chromosomes are so broken and then stuck back together that it's very difficult to actually identify each individual chromosome. So what we can use is a technology called fluorescence in situ hybridization. And fluorescence in situ hybridization uses DNA probes which bind to specific chromosomes. So these probes, we can just buy them from commercial companies. Uh, this one is an example of chromosome 3 and 8 in the uveal melanoma cells. So this is actually some data that I've acquired for uh, a uveal melanoma patient. And in green is highlighting all of the chromosome 8s in that cell, and in red is highlighting chromosome 3 there. And what you can see is this particular uh, set of chromosomes from this particular cell, it's got five copies of chromosome 8, one copy of chromosome 3. Now it would be a long explanation as to explain why, but that means that this patient unfortunately will die from this disease. This genotype of, of loss of chromosome 3, gain of chromosome 8, is associated with death in this tumour. Whereas if you don't have this abnormality, most of the patients survive their surgery and don't develop metastasis. So it's a very useful tool for just quickly finding out how many chromosomes of each type are there. This is what we call a metaphase fish because it's captured in metaphase just like your karyotype that we saw on the previous slide. Now that requires culturing of the cancer cells in the lab and getting chromosomes stuck at the metaphase stage and then performing the fish analysis. Now that is not always possi uh, possible. For various reasons, culturing tumour cells in the lab is often very, very difficult. And what is shown at the bottom is what we call interphase fish. So when cells are in interphase, the nucleus looks like a fuzzy blob. You know, this is an interphase nucleus. This is the remnants of a metaphase nucleus. So these are both in interphase. This is a normal couple of normal cells. This is, excuse me, this is a couple of tumor cells. And these tumor cells have got one spot for red, which is chromosome three, three spots for green, which is chromosome eight. So again, this is a case of the tumor that is a very, very poor prognosis. Now interphase fish is slightly different to metaphase fish in what we are de dealing here, here with is probes which just bind to a small portion of each of those two chromosomes. So we're using a probe to the centromere of chromosome 3 here, 
and a probe to the centromere of chromosome 8 here. Whereas in this example, we've used chromosome paints that highlight the entire chromosome. So these are two different ways of highlighting different genetic regions. You can either have a small probe that highlights one small bit of a chromosome, or you can have a mixture of probes that light up the entire chromosome. So this is chromosome paints. This is standard fish with a single probe. Okay, this slide is going to show you roughly how fish works. So what we've done is we've taken some chromosomes and we've attached them to a glass slide. Now it could be chromosomes as in a metaphase uh, cell like we've seen for the karyotype or it could be a cell nucleus. So this just represents two different chromosomes, it's some DNA, it can either be intact chromosomes in metaphase or it could just be an entire cell nucleus. Okay, so we've got chromosomes attached to this last slide. We need to denature them so that they're single-stranded DNA. We typically use formamide, and that will separate the DNA into single strands. We then need to get some DNA probes which are complementary to the region of interest and label them with either red or green nucleotides. So here's some DNA, and we can label them in the lab with red and green nucleotides by buying green nucleotides mixing them with some uh, some of the DNA and let DNA poly polymerase copy that DNA but only supply fluorescent nucleotides. We then denature the probes to make them single-stranded and that's just representing a mixture of probes to show that they're single-stranded because uh, we've made our chromosomal DNA down here single-stranded and now we've denatured our probe DNA so that's single-stranded. And then we apply the probe and let's see where it binds to. Some of it will bind, most of it will not, but here the green bit is bound, the green probe is bound there, the red probe is bound there. And then we're going to wash away all of the excess. Okay? But the green and the red have still remained bound. Wash that away, and we're left with a green and a red signal. What we then do is counter stain the chromosomal material with DAPI. DAPI is a blue fluorescent dye. So counter stain it with DAPI. And that means that wherever we see a green or a red signal, it should also co localize with a generalized blue signal. And that tells us that the probe is bound specifically to DNA. And this is the sort of thing you would see. Here's a green probe somewhere within a nucleus, here's a red probe somewhere within a nucleus. And here's a red and a green probe sat right next to each other somewhere in the nucleus. And as we will find out, that is um, a diagnostic um, feature that we see in uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. So what happens in chronic myeloid leukemia and lots of other leukemias, to be honest, is you get chromosomes breaking apart and sticking together again. And this chromosome here just happened to represent chromosome 9, this represents chromosome 22. And the reason why I've used those particular chromosomes is on this slide, it shows the karyotype of a chronic myeloid leukemia. There's chromosome 9, there's chromosome 22. Both of them look abnormal. And the reason why they look abnormal is the bottom of this chromosome is stuck on the bottom up here, and the bottom of chromosome 9, just the very tip of it, is actually stuck on the bottom here. So we've got something called a translocation. And what this is doing is disrupting the able oncogene and dry, causing it to be super active. And that is what's driving the cancer to grow. Now we can see this and we can detect it by karyotyping, but that's really quite tedious and very time consuming. We can also detect it by fluorescence in situ hybridization. So this is this image that you've just seen. And this is what it represents. So the orange probe is labelled, in this case, with spectrum orange and is binding to the tip of chromosome 9. The green probe is binding somewhere on chromosome 22. But when the translocation occurs, when a bit of chromosome 22, this bottom bit sticks onto the bottom of chromosome 9 and you get a reciprocal swapping over of DNA, basically we end up with this region of chromosome 9 on chromosome 22, so you end up with the green and the orange probes sat next to each other. 
and when you do a fish stain of leukemia cells in the patient's blood you often see a green and an orangey red and those are the normal chromosomes and then you see a fused signal which represents this translocation event which represents this chromosome here this is what we call the Philadelphia chromosome it was the first genetic aberration ever discovered in cancer now so that was chronic myeloid leukemia we were looking for a fused signal to illustrate a translocation back to the uveal melanoma story which I sort of explained earlier a little bit more detail on that this is again using fish you've seen these two images before there are the normal cells as long as you can count to four and you're not colorblind you could be a clinical cytogeneticist so you've got to be able to see red and green signals and be able to count now what you can see here is this is the case with the additional chromosome uh, eight so chromosome eight is in green in this situation chromosome three is in red and what we can see, this is what we call a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And this shows what happens to patients if they have normal copies of chromosome 8, three copies of chromosome 8, or four or more copies of chromosome 8. And what you can see is this is what we call disease-specific survival. Basically, as this line goes down, this population dies more quickly. So what it shows is if, you, if these patients have got normal, normal numbers of chromosome 8, their survival is generally quite good. If they've got extra copies of chromosome 8, their survival is very, very poor. So we use fish to basically genetically type the tumours and give us an indication as to whether the patients are likely to live or die. Now we can also use fish to look for the gene copy number of specific genes. So on the previous in the previous two examples we've been looking at a chromosome translocation which is the BCR ABL, chronic myeloid leukemia and then in the uveal melanoma whole chromosome losses and gains. Well what tumor cells often do is copy a gene and duplicate it if that gene gives them a growth or survival advantage and breast cancers overexpress the HER2 gene also epidermal growth factor receptor type 2. So they overexpress this gene, but they overexpress it because they have effectively duplicated the entire gene and copied it again and again and again. So in this example here, the HER2 gene is in red, and every little red spot that you can see there is an independent copy of the HER2 gene. And then in green is chromosome 17. The HER2 gene is on chromosome 17 so we can use that as a reference so you can see two independent copies of chromosome 17 in that cell but dozens of copies of the HER2 gene this tells us that it's a very specific HER2 gene amplification that is going on that's driving uh, tumor genesis in this particular tumor and that's helpful because with HER2 overexpression we can give a drug called Herceptin which blocks the HER2 receptor and that is reserved for patients who have got this genetic abnormality in their tumor cells. So this is shown here. This is a representative fish uh, analysis of breast cancer cells, and it's showing four different possible patterns that you observe. Firstly, in green, you can see the control probes. That's chromosome 17. In red, you can see the HER2 gene. So this is two different chromosome 17s within that interphase cell. Remember, in, in interphase, the DNA is decondensed. It's spread out over a largish area. Okay, so that's a normal cell, or normal for HER2. Down here, you've got a classic amplified um, cell where you've got one, two, three, four copies of chromosome 17, but you've got all of these additional copies of uh, the HER2 gene and you've got something similar here one two three copies of chromosome 17 and lots of additional copies here so these are both amplified for HER2 now what we've got here is something different you've still got two green signals you've got two red signals but the red signals are very much more very much larger and that's because we've got something called a tandem duplication here so this means the HER2 gene has been copied back to back lots and lots of times and that gives this big long well this big intense signal so this is maybe 10 15 20 copies of the HER2 gene all back to back 
and that is present on both copies of the chromosome 17. So this would be positive as well. In, in standard fish, we're looking for the number of red spots versus green spots, unless we see something like this. So in all of these cases, this is definitely going to be HER2 positive, it's going to be overexpressing HER2, so is this one. This is a lower level uh, duplication. If you counted the spots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe these eight red spots and three green spots, and we'll find out later whether um, that is clinically relevant. So for a patient to receive Herceptin for their breast cancer, they must overexpress the HER2 gene, and we use the HER2 gene copy number as a proxy marker of whether that HER overexpression is occurring. So we have a little algorithm here that we can follow, and we use do the FISH assay. If we get a gene copy number of greater than six, that is more than greater than six red spots in a, in a typical cell, then that is amplification positive. If we get a ratio of the HER2 gene to chromosome 17 of greater than 2.2, then that's also positive. So for example, if you got a cell that had got four copies of HER2 and two copies of chromosome 17, that would be a ratio of two, so that's not amplified. Whereas if there were five copies of the HER2 gene, that would be amplified. Okay, so if it's greater than 6, it's definitely amplified. If it's a ratio greater than 2.2, it's amplified. If it's less than 4 copies and a ratio of less than 1.8, it's definitely not amplified. And then in this middle ground area are intermediate results, um, where we've got a ratio of about 2 and gene copy number of about 4 to 6, and we don't know whether these are truly amplified or not. These tend to get retested. And upon retest, if you get a, a ratio above two, we say that they are amplification positive and they are then eligible for Herceptin. So one thing to make clear is that FISH is just one of two tests that are routinely done. FISH is done to test the gene copy number or immunohistochemistry, IHC, is performed to look for the protein level. And as we'll see on the next slide, that is scored from 1 to 3. And what we find is if, if cases are equivocal here, that is we don't know if it's positive or negative, we often retest uh, by immunohistochemistry, or sometimes we do immunohistochemistry and then we retest by fish, and we get an equivocal or indeterminate result by both tests. So the two tests are actually often done, one to confirm the other, but sometimes they both confirm that the tumour is indeterminate levels of amplification or overexpression. So this slide illustrates what the uh, immunohistochemistry looks like when we're looking for protein expression within the tumours. So we score this on a score of 0, 1, 2 or 3. 0 is no staining, in, you know, there's virtually no staining, that's negative. 1 is faintly, barely perceptible staining that I can just about make out there. 2 is what we call equivocal, it could be positive, it could be negative, you've got some decent staining in a minority of cells. And then 3 is highly positive, and especially when you can see it on the, on the membrane. This is a cross-section through cells, and you can see there, and you can see on this example, you can see that the cell membranes themselves, the outline of the cells, are incredibly strongly positive. So these are positive. These are possibly positive, tend to be retested by fish, and these are definitely negative. And this is summarised here. So HER2 positivity is where the patients are able to get Herceptin. If they are immunohistochemistry 3 plus score or fish positive, that's 6, plus, six or more copies or a ratio above 2.2, then they are eligible for Herceptin. If they're on an IHC score of 2, it's unclear and you tend to retest by fish. If the fish is positive, then they're eligible. If they're an IHC score of 1 or 0, they're definitely negative and they won't get Herceptin. So this, the main point of doing this is so that you're only giving this Herceptin drug to patients who will respond, and the only patients who will respond are those that have got gene duplication, amplification, or overexpression. Now there's a, a newer version of FISH, and this is called chromogenic in-situ hybridization. And chromogenic in-situ in hybridization works very much like FISH, 
except for we're detecting the two different chromosomes of you know the chromosome 17 and the HER2 gene with a chromogenic immunohistochemistry style detection system instead of fluorescence and we get this red and black staining so it works on the same principle of fish you've got a labeled piece of DNA that binds DNA you know for the either chromosome 17 or the HER2 gene but the signal on it can be visualized by a standard light microscope instead of a fluorescence microscope and this means that the images can be readily overlaid with histology down a light microscope. So this assay shows how the SISH, uh, this shows how the SISH assay works. This is the DNA that we're trying to detect and this is a probe that recognizes that DNA and it's labeled with DNP, dinitrophenol group. And then this probe here, which is the chromosome 17 probe, is digoxygenin labeled. Now DNP and digoxygenin are both haptons. Haptons are small molecules which can be uh, we can generate antibodies to for in antibody detection systems. So if we want to detect whether this probe is bound to this DNA, we can use an antibody that recognizes DNP. So this is a rabbit anti-DNP antibody. And then to detect where that has gone, we can use a goat anti-rabbit antibody, which is conjugated with horse radish peroxidase. And horse radish peroxidase will convert DAB into a black signal which is standard immunohistochemistry. On this side, we've got digoxygenin on the probe. Digoxygenin can be detected by this mouse anti-digoxygenin antibody, and then we can detect where this antibody is bound by using the goat anti-mouse alkaline phosphatase tagged antibody. Alkaline phosphatase will convert fast red into a permanent red signal, which can be seen as a red spot there. So it's the same principles as immunohistochemistry once the DNA probes are bound. In immunohistochemistry, you often have a digoxygenin labeled first antibody, which can be detected by a second. Uh, uh, yeah, we can, we, can use the, we can use digoxygenin and DNP as part of standard immunohistochemistry detection in a slightly different way. I'll not confuse you with that. But this is basically what you need to know for how SISH works. So in summary, we've got three tests that can detect HER2 positivity, SISH, FISH, and immunohistochemistry. FISH is considered the better test over immunohistochemistry, but it's expensive, technically demanding, you need a fluorescence microscope. Immunohistochemistry is easy and cheap, um, but might not predict responses as well as FISH. It's very subjective. Issues relating to fixation can affect how the assay works. FISH uh, so SISH can take over from both uh, on the basis that the signal that it produces is permanent. It can easily be overlaid with light microscopy histology, so H&E staining. And so you can make sure that what you are looking at with the genetic abnormalities in the tumor cells is truly tumor. One of the weaknesses with FISH is sometimes you, you're counting cells which are normal for HER2 gene and it turns out that those cells are actually normal cells because you can't overlay that with histology very easy. It's not always possible to see. With SISH, it's very easy to see that. So we've got these three different tests, all effectively do the same sort of thing. Two of them are detecting genetic changes to the HER2 gene. One is detecting HER2 protein expression. Okay, so that's the end of this section. The next section I'm going to talk about are molecular tests for cancer subtyping.